Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I can see there's a little bit of hindered diffusion in this room because everyone's sitting on this side. They don't make it over to that side. Um, okay, today uh, I'm going to continue to talk about uh, problems in biology uh, from the perspective of control. And uh, today and tomorrow, I'm going to talk about two uh, very important classes of problems, those having to do with pattern and those having to do with growth and size. Uh, and in each case, I'm going to appeal to some of these notions of control and uh, reasons for control and strategies for control and so on. So uh, today we're talking about pattern. But I thought I'd begin by reminding you of one of the lists we went through yesterday, which was some of the objectives of control processes in biology. Right? Some of the things you try to achieve using control, stability, speed, robustness to parameters, ability to reject disturbances, ability to object changes in the structure of the model, ability to adapt, and homeostasis, set point control versus homeoresis, guiding something along the trajectory. So today, we'll see some examples of some of these. And then tomorrow, we'll see some examples of others. Um, so the uh, mechanism of pattern formation that you've already heard about multiple times uh, in this course <laughs> is pattern formation via uh, positional information that's obtained through diffusible molecules or morphogens. So this is the basic morphogen theory, right? The idea that something localized produces a gradient. From the gradient, cells get information. From that information about spatial location, they're able to uh, consult their internal program that enables them to differentiate and behave in, in positional ways. OK. So um, by construction, what I mean is by sort of the construction of this theory, this is clearly not a system in which you expect set point control. The idea being that set point control is something where a system knows where it's supposed to go. And so it's trying to control in order to go there. But of course, if the cells already knew their positional information, you wouldn't have to give them their positional information. Right? So it would be sort of pointless. So this is not that kind of a system where the cells know what they're supposed to do and are trying to you know, avoid having, uh, say, disturbances to that. This is a situation in which you have to tell the cells what to do on the basis of some process. So here we're going to be looking not for too much, say, integral negative feedback. We're going to be looking for situations to, to take a process and try to make it more stable, more robust, more fast, and so on. OK. So uh, to begin with, uh, as we did in a number of situations yesterday, the best place to start asking questions about strategies for control is to take a system and say, well, how does it behave without control, right? Where we say the open loop system without any feedback, how should it behave? Okay, and so we'll talk first about things like stability and speed and then work our way down that list. So as you remember, Back in the early days of thinking about morphogen gradients, folks like Wolpert and Crick envisaged these gradients as simple source sink gradients, where you have a source of something that diffuses to a sink. It's describable by fixed laws with boundary conditions uh, that are you know, sort of production and uh, a zero sink. And you can see dynamically over time, these gradients should evolve in this manner. They're clearly uh, unconditionally stable. This is not a problem. And they evolve at a rate that goes with the square of the distance. Right? And I mentioned that that was one of the arguments that Crick used to establish <laughs> that there should be some maximum length over which you can pattern, because it will take longer and longer in a quadratic fashion to pattern if you try to go too far. But I also alluded to the fact that this model uh, doesn't really agree with much biology, because by the 90s or so, it became possible to start actually visualizing morphogen gradients. And when that became possible, it became clear that they're not straight lines. Uh, this is the DPP gradient. I think you already saw pictures of this gradient in the wing disk from Frank Ulicker. 
Uh, and this is the bicoid gradient uh, using, I think, in this case, an antibody against bicoid to visualize it. But there are other ways it's been visualized as well. And the bicoid gradient, where the measurements are particularly good, it's very easy to see by plotting these on a logarithmic axis uh, that this is truly an exponential gradient, right? This follows the form e to the minus x over some characteristic constant called the decay length. On the other hand, in the case of DPP, you can certainly fit an exponential into that. Uh, whether this is truly exponential is much harder to say, given the noise in these data. But certainly, it doesn't look like it's a straight line. So how can we explain the exponential shape of a morphogen gradient? Well, it turns out a very, very simple modification to uh, Fick's law, simply superposing another term, saying that morphogens are removed, destroyed, decay. You can use whatever term you like, but this refers to the, the molecule uh, leaving the system in some way. Uh, gives you this equation. And when you solve that in the steady state, and when you give boundary conditions that the far boundary is very far, so then it doesn't really matter what boundary condition you put there, uh, then you can show this solves to this form, right? And this makes sense. Exponential is the only function where if you take a second derivative, it's essentially a scaled version of itself, OK? And uh, moreover, this characteristic decay length constant here has a physical meaning, right? It's the square root of the diffusivity divided by this uptake or destruction constant over here. And so that's where you can get these exponentials. But the interesting thing is if you solve that equation uh, dynamically rather than at steady state, and uh, as far as I know, this wasn't really done until I think the early 2000s by Sven Bergman, who, uh, who produced uh, this lovely equation. And you can see here now the approach to the steady state at different locations. So x is 1 half of a decay length would be about here. And then this would be about there. And this would be about there. And so at each location, it's approaching the steady state at a slightly different time. And if you plot all that, you get a curve of time versus distance that's almost perfectly a straight line. It's not exactly a line, but it's very, very close to being a straight line. Where essentially, the time to go a certain distance, x scaled to this decay length constant, is basically just related to this um, uh, degradation or destruction or removal rate constant over here. Uh, but you can also express it in terms of the diffusivity and that constant as well because of the definition of what the decay rate constant is. Okay, so this is actually, sorry, yeah? Yeah, so this represents the time it takes at any point to get 1 minus 1 over E or about 2 thirds of the way to steady state. Okay, so each, point, each one of these reaches that time at a different, I'm sorry, reaches that uh, uh, percentage of the way to steady state at a different time. And that's going up linearly with distance. Okay, so remember, simple diffusion, it goes with the square of distance. Here, it goes linearly with distance. Okay, and so this is the other reason why Crick was wrong, right? Because had he known that gradients were exponential, Right, then he would have realized that the assumption that things go with the square of distance actually no longer holds. Things go linearly with distance. And therefore, there sh you shouldn't have to wait an inordinate amount of time to make a gradient bigger. The, the other thing would, that would be true then is that the farther you are from the source, mm -hmm. the later you come to stability. And if getting to stability early is important, Right. And you're going to want that. You're going to want to read the gradient relatively close to the source. Right. Of course. Of course. It's it's true that um, the the time at which you reach steady state is going to get later and later farther away. That's true both whether you have an exponential gradient or just a linear gradient. It will still take longer farther away. So there could be constraints on that as well. <coughs> 
Yes, it is counterintuitive, isn't it? <laughs> but again, it's counterintuitive for the same reason. Remember we discussed how negative feedback makes things faster, and that seems counterintuitive? It's the same reason, is that you have to think scaled to the steady state. So in other words, by throwing in degradation, certainly you're taking molecules away, and therefore you should think it should take longer to get to the same value. But here we're not asking the amount of time it takes to get to a particular value, we're asking the amount of time it takes to get to the steady state for that location. And that steady state is declining exponentially. So you don't have to get to as high a value. So that's a very good point, right? You have to scale these in order to plot them this way. Okay. So, and we'll come back to that because the values are definitely getting lower at a, essentially at a faster rate when they're declining exponentially as opposed to linearly. But the point is we can use this curve to make some very nice estimations about the time it takes to form morphogen gradients. And for reasons we can talk about later, you know, most of the patterning that we see takes place within two or three length scales of the source of morphogens. And within that region, at least, the time uh, that it takes to reach steady state at those distances can be read you know, right off this curve. And it should be basically one to two times the half-life that's associated with that decay rate constant k. Okay, but because of this relationship between k and lambda and d, we can also ex re-express that time as just lambda squared times a constant over d. So in other words, if you know the time that it takes to form something, and you know the decay length because you've watched, you've observed the picture, static picture of the morphogen gradient, then you should be able to ex extract the diffusion coefficient from that information. Okay, so everybody gets it. This is a should be a way to measure the diffusion coefficient uh, that applies to a morphogen gradient by looking at the shape of the morphogen gradient and looking at how fast it forms or how fast it returns after you've perturbed it a certain amount. That should work. And in fact, many people do that type of experiment using the following type of perturbation. If you can make the morphogen fluorescent, which as you've seen, we can use fusion proteins to look at fluorescent morphogens, you can bleach a very small spot of that fluorescence, and then you can watch the recovery as molecules diffuse back in and reestablish the morphogen gradient inside your little spot. Okay, and so you can do the math and calculate the amount of time it should take according to that equation to refill that spot. And you get a sort of relaxation curve from which you extract a time constant. Given that time constant, which will give you k, and given the decay length of the morphogen gradient, lambda, you should be able to pull out d. So this was done for bicoid um, a number of years ago. And the d that was pulled out um, was about 0.3 micron squared per second from those experiments. Uh, in this case, the decay length is 100 microns for the, entire, for, for the morphogen gradient. It's a fairly large one. And so if you put that together, then for the whole embryo, it should take about 6.4 hours for the gradient to set up in the embryo. And that, of course, is a bit of a problem because bicoid does its job in less than two hours, it would be fair. And, the, and in fact, observations of the gradient show that it sets up in less than two hours. So that's just one example in which FRAP was used to measure diffusion coefficient. Another example, I think, Frank may have referred to this in the DPP gradient in the Drosophila wing disc. FRAP was used to sort of bleach these little rectangles and then watch the DPP fill in. And again, using exactly the same methods, the diffusion coefficient of 0.1 square micron per second was, was obtained. Just for comparison, diffusivities of proteins in water are typically about 100 square microns per second. Diffusivities of proteins in normal fluids like intracellular you know, cytoplasm or extracellular fluids tend to be more like 20 to 50, 20 to 40 square microns per second. So this is orders of magnitude lower than you might expect. Okay, so is this uh, somehow there's some kind of special control that's enabling these gradients to form faster 
despite having very slow diffusion coefficients? Or is it simply that the measurements are wrong? And one set of observations suggests that the measurements are wrong. And that's because there's an independent way to measure diffusivity. I think some of you are aware of fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which is a technique in which you illuminate. Uh, I think we mostly lost the battery on this one. In which you illuminate uh, a little tiny spot, and you look at the fluctuations in fluorescence in that spot. Those fluctuations are due to diffusivity of molecules in and out of the spot. If you plot the autocorrelation um, in, in those fluctuations, you can calculate, you, you can determine the mean time it takes for a molecule to cross the spot. And from that, you get a diffusion coefficient. Um, and in fact, that's been done for DPP in the very same system. You get a diffusion coefficient of about 20 microns squared per second, consistent with free diffusion in, in, uh, in, uh, in fluid. Um, and if you do the same thing for bicoid, you get about seven, fairly consistent with free diffusion, and at least more than an order of magnitude over what you get in FRAP. If you do it in, for FGF in the zebrafish, you get about 50 square microns per second. So again, you get very large numbers by FCS, and you get these small numbers by FRAP, right? Yeah, so you can, from first principles, try to calculate what the diffusion coefficients should be if you know the viscosity of the medium, right? And if you use a viscosity of water, you get numbers about 100 square microns per second. Now, the viscosity of biological fluids is, is you know, higher than water, and so that's why you typically get numbers up to an order of magnitude less than that. Okay, so to get these very small numbers, you have to have some type of very severe hindrance, right? And, and you know, it's, it would be unclear where that would come from. Yeah, so that's, I'm glad you asked that question. So another thing that can uh, influence the, the apparent diffusivity of something is tortuosity, right? If it has to diffuse through a space in which there are many, many obstacles, tortuosity kind of is like a, a different sort of viscosity. The nice thing about tortuosity is that while it can lower a diffusion coefficient, typically it can't lower it by more than about threefold. The reason be, unless the tortuosity has, has been specifically ordered. But if you have random tortuosity, what happens is the longer paths that you have to take due to the tortuosity are to some extent mitigated by the fact that you also have much smaller volumes through which you have to diffuse, which actually speeds you up. Right? And so the two things eventually in the limit cancel each other out, and you get to about a threefold change. So you can't get big orders of magnitude changes from tortuosity, which, which actually is a good point, because a lot of biologists' intuition would be to be really hard to diffuse in and around cells because it's such a tortuous environment. But the reality is that's not such a big deal. And a lot of the years of experiments of people measuring diffusivity in the brain, for example, of injected drugs really validates that. Intercellular diffusion is not much slower than diffusion in free space. OK, so why these big discrepancies between FCS and FRAP? Yes? I'm sorry, you can't. Um, you mean between the viscosity and the diffusion coefficient? Right, but there's a relationship between the viscosity and what you measure, right? A thermal system. And you mean as opposed to a system in which transport is by some other process? Okay, I'm not sure that's a, a major correction to, to any of this, though, right? I mean, I think. Things are happening on very long time scales. Things really are pretty much just floating around in space here. So we can talk about it later, but I don't think there's a, there's a, there's a big issue here. I think there are, there are other more significant issues here. So the thing to point out is that um, photo bleaching is an experiment in which you perturb and you recover according to this equation, right? So the idea is that, you know, given 
uh, measurement of recovery, which depends largely on K, as you saw, right? The rate of approach is essentially dependent on K. And given a knowledge of lambda, you should be able to calculate D, right? But that's based on a very, very simple model. Now, that's under the hood of that simple model is something like this, where you have cells, and they have receptors, and you have morphogens. And the morphogens are floating around. And it's these receptors that are responsible for this K. The receptors are binding the morphogen. They're taking in the morphogen. They're destroying the morphogen. Okay. In the case of bicoid, it's slightly different. right? The receptors are presumably the nucleus, and something else is destroying the morphogen. So it's a slightly different model. But for most of the morphogens, the extracellular morphogens, this is kind of a pretty good model. And if you really want to write that model out explicitly, it looks something like this. Right? You have now a diffusion equation for the morphogen. And you have binding equations to the receptor and unbinding. And then the receptor has equations for production and destruction. And then the bound morphogen has equations for going in and coming out. And the internal morphogen has equations for going out and being degraded and so on. You get a whole bunch of equations. Even if you solve this in the steady state, of course, these equations all become algebra, so you can you know, uh, isolate all the variables and basically get a single uh, differential equation in the steady state, which kind of looks like that original equation. It's slightly different. But if we make the assumption that morphogen concentrations are low, um, then we can get it to look exactly like our original equation, right? just diffusion balanced by decay. So the reason you have to make this morphogen is low assumption is because receptors are saturable, right? And so only in the regime of low levels of morphogens can we treat binding to receptors as linear, right? And so under those conditions, right, this, this which includes the saturability of receptors now reduces to that. And so to get that equation we've all been using, right, this is really what's under the hood of this K over here. So the problem is, that that means that the decay length of the morphogen gradient is determined by all of this together. Right? And consider, for example, the possibility that if k off or k out, I, either of these, uh, is close to 0, meaning that things tend to go in, but they tend not to come out, then this k is going to be independent, for example, of this k deg term, the, de the actual degradation term. That's why it's always bothersome when people refer to this as a degradation rate constant. It's not. It's a removal rate constant. This is the rate constant at which the diffusing species is removed from the diffusing pool. That's it. And you can, under the right conditions, this can be almost completely unrelated to the actual rate at which the morphogen turns over. Absolutely. So the cookie's moving through. If it sticks to stuff, so it gets transiently trapped. Right. Comes off, right. Comes on. The, all, all of those possibilities are in those rate constants. Depends on where you set them. Right. So yes, you could have a case in which the, most of the time things just come back off the receptor. But the point is, if that's the path to being decayed, right, then that plays a role in K. If that's just a dead end and then you come back off again and it has no relationship to, then that actually drops out of the steady state. But, it would, but it seems intuitively, it seems that if the, even if it's just a non specific binding, unrelated or independent right. of decay, but um, right. increases mobility. Well, okay, so if you just have something like this, bicoid plus something that's not a receptor it goes to that, or bicoid gets destroyed by an enzyme, right? then this is going to affect the dynamics, but it's not going to affect the decay length. But on the other hand, if you have something like that, even as a possibility, then this will affect both the dynamics and the decay length. So it sort of it depends. But anyway, OK, go ahead. So if we, yeah, 
No, in, okay, so two separate things. This model here is for an extracellular morphogen that's spreading between the cells. Bicoid is a little special, right? It's an intracellular morphogen. It starts in this biggest syncytial cell and spreads within it. Okay, so two different models, but the same underlying math. It's just the meaning of these constants may be a little different in those cases. Fitting models, okay. I mean, I, there's also experimental issues. I won't get into them because there are experimental issues with how you get those constants out of FRAP. But I think the more dominant thing, right, is this issue, that the decay length depends on this. But FRAP depends on some combination of these, okay, and particularly on whichever one is slowest, right, because essentially what you're doing is with each of these equations here, is you're filling up different pools, right? A pool on the surface, a pool inside, another, there may be another pool, and so on. Each pool has its own turnover, and each has a characteristic time of turning over, and you're essentially taking a, a sum of all those times, and that's what you're measuring by FRAP. And so, for example, if things go into the cell and spend a long time there, that means KDEG is low, and FRAP will essentially give you KDEG. But remember, I told you if K off is very small, like zero, then the lambda, the decay length, will not give you. It will be totally unrelated to KDEG. It will be something entirely different. And so that's the flaw in using that formula to get the diffusion coefficient out of FRAP, is you're assuming that the decay length of, of the gradient is actually related to the thing that's causing the relaxation time in FRAP. And so just to give you an example, right, these are... You could think of it as an effective diffusion and... No, it's not. It's, a fl it's an error. It's not a defective... Well, I still can't figure out how to get your maintenance to give up longer. I mean, it seems that everything you're doing is slowing down movement. How do you get to reconcile... So FRAP isn't measuring movement. FRAP is measuring relaxation. It's measuring a system's return to steady state, and the system you're measuring is all of these compartments. And some of these compartments are returning to steady state mainly because of these rate constants. That's what you're measuring with FRAP. If you could only measure this compartment alone, it should return on a time scale that reflects only diffusion. But you have no way to measure that. You can only measure the total morphogen. No, it's not a longer length scale, so you get a shorter diffusion coefficient than you expect. So, for example, uh, if you fit, assuming that the same k that determines lambda is the k that determines FRAP, you get the number that's reported in the literature. If you take the same data, but now you put in these pools and reasonable rate constants that fit the kind of concentrations that are observed at steady state within these pools, you can easily get a diffusion coefficient that exactly matches the FCS. You get the right lambda? I mean, if you do this exercise for big type, you get a lambda that is 100 micro. So to do the exercise for bicoid, right, what you have to have, again, is some system in which bicoid delays in some state before it's decayed. That's all you need, right? So instead of having just bicoid goes to this, it has to be bicoid goes to some state, which hangs around for a while, and then goes to that. As long as that exists, you can adjust that diffusion coefficient to whatever you like. So the point is not that you can get the right number out of FRAP. The point is you can't get a number out of FRAP. <laughs> The number you get it is, is an illusion unless the model is exactly the original model, right? Where k, there's only one k and there's only one species. Okay, so anyway, that's, uh, I thought you would enjoy that part because it's physics. <laughs> All right, so um, now does that mean, yes, question. Well, you'll see the 
this is not a perfect, uh, so this one and that one don't have a perfectly the same shape. Of course, you'd never tell that in the lab. But so you don't get, a, a, actually in neither case is it truly a, a, a strictly exponential approach. Okay, because the formula, remember the formula for the, the, the time spread of a morphogen gradient was this ugly thing with error functions and so on. So it's not perfectly exponential either. But yes, the shape is slightly different. But that, the point of that is to show you that it's very slight. Correct. Right. For the total pool of molecule to fill in. Right. 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 Yes. Very good point. Okay. So, so the point you're making, and this is a point a lot of people uh, say is FCS measures movement on very microscopic spatial and temporal scales, right? So for a period of time, things might be moving fast, but then they might stick to something and might be moving slow. And actually, you can sort of see that if you look at the FCS measurements for DPP, you can see about half the molecules are actually in a slow pool. So this is what you see in FCS is two pools. There's a fast pool and a slow pool. Presumably, the real molecules may be going back and forth between those pools. So you would have an effective diffusivity, right, due to trapping that would be lower. Now, the important thing to remember about those kinds of effective diffusivities is they have a big effect on the transient behaviors of such systems, right, like the time it would take to form. But they have no effect on the steady state. They won't affect lambda, okay? And the reason is, if you put in an extra equation here where something bound and then unbound from, say, a hindering site, right, that equation would completely drop out um, when you turned it to this, right? Because in the steady state, it just goes to local equilibrium, right? So you'll accumulate morphogen, but you, as much will be going on as will be going off at any location in space. So you can't really affect the steady state shape by hindered diffusion. That's another misconception in the literature, right? But you can definitely affect the dynamics, okay? So it's, think of like a capacitor, right? A capacitor affects the dynamics of an electric circuit, but at the steady state, right, the capacitor does nothing, right? It just, it just holds stuff. I mean, it takes some of the charge away, but it doesn't change the shape of anything. Okay? All right. So let's move on from that topic of uh, speed. So basically, the idea is that because diffusion is fast and because things go linearly with distance, really spreading morphogens is not a problem. Okay? But it's very difficult to measure the real rate that morphogens spread at because of the fact that techniques like FCS are sensitive to things that are outside of what you really want to be measuring, which is the speed of the morphogen itself. Okay, let's talk about parametric robustness now. And here I'm going to focus on the Drosophila wing. And you've heard a lot about this, so I'm going to just very quickly go through uh, the, the basic setup. Remember, the wing has these veins that have to be patterned along the anterior posterior axis. It occurs in this epithelial tissue called the disc. It starts off because the morphogen hedgehog is produced in one half, the posterior half. That corresponds to this part of the wing. And one of the veins is patterned close to the hedgehog boundary over here, which is the original anterior posterior boundary in the wing disc. Hedgehog is a morphogen at a distance from hedgehog. Uh, it patterns the L3 vein. So uh, targets of hedgehog determine where this vein is going to occur. Hedgehog also determines where DPP is going to be expressed. DPP diffuses out in both directions. Here's a picture of the DPP gradient uh, using G GFP DPP. But very often what we track with the DPP gradient is phosphorylated MAD protein because that's the direct target of the activated DPP receptor. So this antibody basically picks up the receptor's activity. You can see there's two gradients going in the anterior and the posterior. 
And these two gradients, respectively, set the positions of the L2 and the L5 veins. Okay. So knowing that, then, one way we can try to ask how parametrically robust the patterning system is, is by making heterozygous mutants. That is, taking away one copy of the receptor genes or other genes. So, for example, you know, the morphogen genes, for example. Here we take away one copy of DPP, and you have to play some genetic tricks to get the embryos to live through that. So these involve different genetic tricks for doing it. But what you can see is in all cases the L2-3 vein spacing and the L4-5 vein spacing, which represent the positioning of these DPP-dependent veins, show a small change in, in uh, width when you take one copy of DPP away. When you take one copy of DPP away, nothing happens to the L3-4 vein spacing. That's the one that's set by Hedgehog. So that's kind of like a positive control. It shows you, or negative control, I should say. It shows you that this doesn't change because it's not supposed to. It's a different morphogen that sets that. So there is an effect. So it's not perfectly robust, right? There is an effect of taking away one copy of DPP. Here we take away one copy of the DPP receptor. It's called thick veins, or TKV. And here, it looks pretty good. Really can hardly tell any difference between these two wings. Um, and then finally, here we take away one copy of the hedgehog gene, and we're looking at one particular hedgehog target called Collier. And again, it looks pretty good. So how good is pretty good, right? Remember yesterday we talked about the fact that we need a metric for, me for quantifying robustness. The typical metric we use is the sensitivity coefficient, right, which is the slope of a log-log plot or the relative relative derivative. You can look at a number of ways. Remember, sensitivity of 1 means linearly related. Sensitivity of 2, quadratic. Sensitivity of 0.5 varies as the square root and so on. And engineers like to keep sensitivity down below about 0.3. That's usually the threshold when people say something's robust. So now you can go back to these cases and say, okay, so this thing is about for a presumed twofold change in the morphogen, there's about a 14% change in pattern. Here, there's less than a 10% change in pattern. Here, there's less than a 5% change in pattern. So from an engineering standpoint, that's pretty good, right? That's, we'd, we'd be happy with that kind of robustness very often. Now the question is, what do we need to get that kind of robustness? If we go back to the model that we have of the exponential gradient, we can ask the simple question, how robust should position be? All right. So for example, if we were to take that gradient and increase the amplitude of the gradient by a factor of 2, how much would pattern change? So the idea is that if you're specifying a, a particular structure at this location, then when the gradient goes up, the location is going to move over by that much. Okay, so really we want to know how much does the gradient shift to the right as a function of being shifted upward. That's essentially the question we're asking, but we want to ask that as a, um, a sensitivity. So it's very easy to figure that out, right, because you can invert this and have x as a function of the concentration. And then, so therefore, the change in x is just equal to that, right, which... Uh, means that if this is a two-fold change in the morphogen, that everything shifts by lambda, the decay length, times two, uh, times the logarithm of two. Okay, but of course we want to do that as a sensitivity coefficient. And so if we want to do it that way, we take the derivative of that with respect to its concentration, right, the thing that's being changed, multiplied by the initial concentration divided by the function itself, rearrange that, and then we can substitute x over lambda for that based on the definition here. And so there you get that the sensitivity is simply the decay length over the position. In other words, as the thing gets farther and farther out, it becomes less and less sensitive. And that makes sense, because even though it's moving by the same amount, in fractional terms, this is a much smaller movement than that, right? That's a big fractional movement, and this is a very small fractional movement. And so you can get a curve like this that essentially captures, for this morphogen gradient, here's what the sensitivity of positional information is to a change in the amount of morphogen at the start of the gradient. Okay, so everybody follow that? So one of the nice things, oh, so just to, to put this in, x needs to be at least 
three lambdas in order to get acceptable robustness. Right? Basically, you're saying this falls and it hits this kind of good region somewhere around three times the decay length constant. So that's saying for any morphogen gradient, if you just pattern far enough away, you can achieve good robustness. You don't need anything special. Now, just as an aside, one of the nice things about doing sensitivity coefficients is something I alluded to yesterday, which is that you can often calculate them even when you can't solve the initial equation that you're trying to calculate them for. So, for example, if you take the equation that doesn't make the assumption of receptors being far from saturation, I right? remember there was a form of the equation that looked a bit like this, where I said, you know, assume this is small, right, because then receptors aren't getting saturated. But let's take the full equation where we allow receptors to be saturated. And here, C stands for morphogen normalized in such a way that a value of 1 means receptors are 50% saturated. Anyway, you can't solve this differential equation even in the steady state, right? I, I dare you to. But <laughs> anyway, there, there's, there is no um, analytical solution that anybody's found for this. And yet you can still find the sensitivity very, very easily, right? The trick being that you can differentiate this once with respect to distance. You just multiply it by dc dx on both sides and, and differentiate once with respect to distance, and you can actually get an analytical, albeit implicit, solution for the first derivative. And the first derivative is what you need to calculate the, to ca the uh, sensitivity coefficient. So you can sort of go directly to the sensitivity coefficient. One of the things you can see is because this number is always greater than 1, when you allow for receptor saturation, the sensitivity is always greater than it would be without allowing for receptor saturation. So in other words, neglecting receptor saturation gives you a, a false impression that the sensitivity is better than it really should be. Okay. In fact, allowing for receptor saturation can have really bad effects on robustness if you take into account the fact that morphogens have a producing region and they have receptors too, and they're turning over in that region. And if they're saturated there, then uh, it's particularly bad. Because if you have, say, a two-fold change in morphogen, there's no capacity to absorb it in the uh, production region. And you can get really big changes both in the starting point of the gradient and in how robust it is um, as a result of that. So, um, so we have to watch out about uh, receptor saturation when thinking about um, sensitivities. Yes. Yes. So when you have receptor saturation, the apparent decay length will actually get bigger. And eventually, um, so it'll get kind of more like that. And underlying that, if you look at the receptor bound morphogen, it will go to start looking like that. All right. So, yes. And actually, that brings up an important point, which I have here. Um, when you have an exponential gradient, of course, you can define the decay length as the, the um, constant that lies inside the exponential. But if you have something that doesn't truly have an exponential shape, you can still define something called a local decay length uh, by analogy. Essentially, it would be the decay length of the best fit exponential at that point. But very simply, it's just the ratio of the function to its own derivative, because that's what this is as well. So for any function, we can always calculate in a, a local decay length. And your point is if you have receptor saturation, then you'll get an increase in the local decay length, and then it'll go back to the original local decay length later on. Uh, well, no, it's as you go farther out, they become less and less saturated. Right? So saturation is always the biggest problem closest to the morphogen source. So let's talk a little bit about receptors, OK? So remember, starting with these equations, this is what we've used as our equations for the morphogen, right? For in the very simplest term, forgetting about receptor saturation. How do we build in robustness to receptors when receptors don't appear in this equation, right? <laughs> so they do appear. They appear implicitly. Receptors appear here because this reflects the uptake by receptors. And since k appears in the denominator, you would imagine that if you increase the number of receptors, what would you do to the decay length? 
decrease it, right? So a gradient should shrink when you increase the number of receptors. However, the gradient you measure is the signal gradient, the gradient of morphogen that's bound to receptors. And if you have more receptors, more morphogen will be bound to it. So what you should have when you increase the number of receptors is greater amplitude. Okay. And so in fact, you have both. If you do the equations where you explicitly put receptors in there, you see both effects occur. As you increase receptors, you increase the amplitude, but decrease the decay length. And you can see this here in these simulations where we're varying the, it's, not, it's just an equation, just solved, but you're varying the concentration of receptor as it goes up, right? The amplitude goes up and the thing pulls in. As it goes down, the amplitude goes down and the thing flattens out, right? This is, in fact, exactly what you get in experiments. If you overexpress receptors, pull in the gradient, but the gradient gets a higher amplitude, okay? But since you can uh, determine this um, analytically, you can also turn that into a, into a sensitivity coefficient curve. And the reason why this has this inflection point here is because this is the absolute value. The reality is, is it goes down below here. It switches from things before this point are actually pulled up by more receptors. Things beyond that point are pushed down. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> Think, yeah, no, it's the, things beyond that point are pushed down by more receptors and are pushed up by fewer receptors. Now, my reason for showing this is to put this in and have you noticed something very, very important? Is there any position, X, in which you can be simultaneously robust to both morphogens and receptors? There's not, right? So that's actually a really interesting result. It's telling you that in the open loop system, characterized by the simple morphogen gradient with production and destruction, it's car categorically <laughs> impossible to be robust to both types of perturbations at the same time, at the same patterning position in space. Okay, right? There's no location where you can do it. And so there's only one way out of that, which is to say that the model has to be wrong. Okay, so the model is right from the standpoint of fitting data, right? but from the standpoint of achieving any type of reasonable robustness, that you would expect in the real world, that can't be the right model, because that model can't be robust to two things that we know, empirically, you are robust to at the same time. And so the point is that's an open loop model, right? That's a model with no control in it. It's just assuming hedgehog turns on DPP, DPP turns on MAD, MAD takes care of patterning, and you're done. You have the physics of diffusion, which set the gradient and, and so on, right? So. How can we repair the model? So if you go to the biology and you look at what's known in this system in terms of things that interact with DPP, with the morphogen, with pattern, and so on, you get something like this, as of now. It keeps getting worse as people do more and more experiments, right? But there's a hideous amount of feedback and feed forward and all kinds of stuff going on. And let me take you through a little bit of it. So for example, the synthesis of morphogens, and, uh, of receptors, right, for both hedgehog and for DPP are controlled by the morphogen gradients themselves. The, uh, synth there are these uh, binding proteins uh, that act as co-receptors for both hedgehog and DPP, and their synthesis is controlled by the morphogen gradients themselves, both hedgehog and DPP. Um, there's feedback regulation on the production of, uh, on the destruction of hedgehog and on the production of hedgehog by the morphogen gradient itself, and then that feeds forward onto DPP, right? There's substances that feed back and control the spread of the morphogen, um, which we'll talk about at the end. I think Frank alluded to some of that. And there are even extra morphogens in the system that people don't like to talk about. Uh, things of the same protein family, but expressed rather differently and work through the same receptors, one of which is called glass bottom boat. And so the question is, are these control strategies, right? Is the reason these things are there to achieve the control that you clearly can't achieve, uh, at least from the standpoint of getting good robustness from the very, very simple model? Okay, so 
Let's talk about some possible ways in which these extra loops could be control strategies. So remember, the simple model is just morphogens are produced, transported, and uniformly degraded as they're transported. And now let's consider what happens if we add in the fact that there's something else that binds the morphogen that's being produced in this system. And uh, perhaps this is doing the uptake and the destruction rather than just that, okay? So that's easy, we just add one more equation. In the steady state, it's just a little more algebra. And now you can very easily get the sensitivity curves for, uh, for a variation in morphogen production and for variation in receptor production to overlie each other. So bravo, right? We can be robust right out here. But what's the problem, right? What's the trade-off? So in order to do this trick, you had to express another protein, right? You had to express this other non-receptor binding site and have it do the destruction. Well, wouldn't you want to be robust to that, <laughs> right? And the problem is you're not, right? You're terribly non-robust to that. So you've traded robustness to one protein product for robustness to another protein product. And that's not a big help, right? You're, you're, that's kind of an even swap. So that's not a particularly good strategy. Let's consider another strategy. Who's to say that the um, uptake by receptors is uh, necessarily linear? In other words, it's proportional um, to the amount of morphogen. What if the morphogen controls its own uptake? What if the morphogen's own signal controls how actively it's taken up? So this is something that Nama Barkai postulated um, a number of years ago. And notice that in at least two well-known morphogen signaling pathways, Morphogens do, in fact, upregulate their own degradation or own uptake. Uh, in the hedgehog, it's because hedgehog upregulates its expression of its own receptor. In the case of wingless, it's because wingless downregulates its own receptor, but its own receptor also downregulates its own degradation, for reasons that are still not terribly well understood. Uh, through a numerical screen, uh, Nama noticed that uh, these systems were more robust than the simple system where degradation was just uh, constant. Um, and one of the interesting things about these systems is if you model this uh, signaling dependent increase in uptake by simply putting an exponent here, so now essentially degradation goes with the square of morphogen concentration, these things solve to fairly simple power law equations, which if you plot them, generate curves that eh, they look kind of exponential, but they're not, right? This is actually a power law curve, which means it doesn't have a single decay length associated with it, right? It has different decay lengths at different positions. At the beginning, it has a very steep decay. At the end, it has a much shallower decay than this. And it's easy to show that in both of these systems, the sensitivity to morphogen uh, varies with the, the same form, lambda over x, but here it's the lambda at position zero where it's very, very steep and so is very short. And so consequently, this is more robust than that. And that was the point that, um, that uh, Nama's paper was trying to make is simply using this shape means that if you shift up by a certain amount here, you shift less over here. And that's what, what this is, uh, is pointing out. Now, you might imagine there'd be some price to pay for that strategy, too. Sorry? In the other direction. You mean if you shift position? No, would it... I'm saying that if you increase from 1 to 2, you increase from 1 to Yes. No, it's still, the sensitivity works both ways, right? So it's, this is simply the constant that says how, um, what the fold change in x will be for any fold change in y. Okay, and that's whether you increase or decrease. Okay, so what's the cost for this strategy? Every strategy has a cost. So here it's a little trickier to see what it is. And to figure it out, I have to go on to the next performance objective, and then it will become clear. And that's disturbance rejection, okay? So let's talk a little bit about disturbance rejection. So a lot of times when we talk about that, we're talking about the effect of noise on a system. So noise can mean a lot of things, right? But what here, in a patterning system, when we think in a noise-free way, right, we have this very French flag idea 
that there's some threshold at which you turn on a gene, and so you would get this interpretation, right? But if you had a noisy morphogen gradient or a noisy interpretation of a morphogen gradient, you get something like this, right? And so, the, in other words, there's imprecision in figuring out where that boundary is, and it's associated with something that we could quantify, which we'll call a transition width. And uh, we know from em empirical studies that having too big a trans transition width is a bad thing because the purpose of these boundaries that are set by DPP is to set up these pro or vein primordia. And if your transition width is too big, if the boundary is too fuzzy, you get these very, very fuzzy vein primordia. And when uh, it becomes time to form the pupil wing, those fuzzy vein primordia give rise to multiple veins, right? So this is a very bad wing uh, because you're not able to specify the position with enough precision there. Okay, so we want to be able to quantify that transition with that amount of precision that we should expect in a morphogen gradient. So typically we'll think about um, the noise as noise in the signal, right? So noise in this direction. And we can approximate it as just a variance, right? We'll just use that moment to approximate the noise. And we want to know how much does variance in that direction translate to variance in this direction, right? So we just need the scaling factor for going from one direction to the other. And that scaling factor is simply the relative derivative, right? Well, the scaling factor is the derivative, but if we're looking at relative noise, that is, coefficient of variation or relative standard deviation, then it's the relative derivative that provides the conversion to the transition width. Okay, so basically the transition width is just the coefficient of variation of the noise divided by the absolute value of the relative derivative. But remember what the absolute value of the relative derivative is, is one over the length scale. Okay, the apparent local length scale. So that then gives you Right, that the width is just the coefficient of variation times the local length scale. All right, and that makes sense, right? If something's very shallow and you have a lot of noise, you're going to have a very broad zone of imprecision. If something's very steep and you have a lot of noise, it's still only going to be a short zone where the noise confuses you before you climb out of it. And so right away now you can see what the problem is with self-enhanced decay. The price for making this curve steep here, but having the same kind of average values as that there, is it must be shallow there. And the price for having it shallow there, right, is that the noise effects are going to be much worse here. You're going to have much more imprecision for the same amount of noise here as you are to have there. Okay, so now let's talk about whether that really matters or not, or this is just a theoretical problem. So first of all, where does the noise come from? It can come from fluctuations in the morphogen concentration because diffusion is really a discrete process. Turns out those are very, very minor because they happen on such a fast time scale. It can come from cell to cell variation in gene expression. That's probably a really big deal, but we don't understand that much about it. It can come from background or ligand independent signaling. Probably there's not too much of it, but we don't really understand that very well. The thing we do understand are fluctuations in receptor occupancy simply due to the fact that binding is a stochastic process, right? Not really uh, a mass action process, right? So for example, if you, if you simulate binding you know, uh, using the Gillespie algorithm and you have these average receptor occupancies, this is what a cell is really going to see, right? And here we're simulating the whole system, not including taking in and turning over, but I'm only showing you this here, right? And so you would expect, as a Poisson process, the coefficient of variation is going to go with the square root of the mean. So the lower the mean, the bigger the noise. That's not that surprising. The question is, are these physiologically relevant numbers to be talking about? Average receptor occupancies of 200 per cell, 50 per cell. People who work with mammalian cells in culture like to have, you know, thousands of receptors occupied. So you know, they don't worry too much about stochastic variation. But it turns out in a morphogen gradient, you have to worry greatly about it. And I won't go through all of this, but if you do some basic calculations based on the sizes of the cells, the extracellular volume fraction, in fact, none of these are very sensitively affecting the result. So these are, you know, rough numbers. 
You can calculate the receptor concentration in extracellular space. Uh, and we know that the decay length is really the rate of diffusion divided by the rate of capture by receptors, and that depends upon the number of receptors and the uh, association rate constant. And so you get a kind of limit on that. And putting in the slowest possible association rate constant, the slowest known for any tight binding event, you get that the number of receptors per cell has to be below 700. Okay. Otherwise, morphogen gradients just can't spread far enough. They're going to be captured too quickly. So you've got to keep the capture rate down. And if you have 700 receptors per cell and they're only 20% saturated, because remember at the beginning, if they're very saturated, that's terrible for robustness, right? So now you're left with receptor numbers in this ballpark at the positions in a gradient where you'd be doing patterning. Okay, there are other tricks to try to get around this we could talk about later. But on the face of it, it looks like, at least at the surface, you have to have very, very low receptor numbers. And so these kinds of variations are likely, uh, you know, are definitely expected at the cell surface. Question? Uh, sorry, binding of a transcription factor to a promoter is all, it's also a stochastic process, yes. But here we're just dealing with binding at the cell surface. All right, but all of these things, are, as long as the numbers of molecules are small, these stochastic fluctuations can be large. So I, what I've did, just done is gone through it. So mass action is an illusion, right? I mean, the reality is always stochastic. And mass action is simply the approximation you can use when things are, have large enough numbers that uh, you, know, you, you can ignore the stochastics. Okay, but it's always correct to treat things stochastically. And then in, when you see that the stochastic effects are large enough, then you know you have to take them into account. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, what is... Just make that, yeah, make that fast, right. Right, right. So here's the problem. Yes, yes. Yes, we'll get to that. There, there will be some averaging later. But here's the problem. In order to keep the morphogen from being captured and preventing the spread of the gradient, the, on, the, the association rate constant must be quite, quite low. In order for the uh, uh, thing to have any significant affinity, that is specificity, the dissociation rate constant has to be even lower than the association rate constant. But the dissociation rate constant being slow means the dynamics of the whole thing are very slow. So you can't average out the noise, right? The noise is very slow noise. As you look at the, see hours, right? And so the only averaging you can do is downstream, which, we, which I will get to, hopefully. Okay. All right. So that's that we should expect noise. But, you know, that's theory, right? Now, are, is there noise? Um, so you can look with GFP DPP, and you can see, well, first of all, a lot of GFP is inside cells. This should not surprise you. Because remember, we said the model was the DPP gets taken up and probably spends a very long time inside the cell. That's why FRAP doesn't work. Um, well, there it is. You can see huge amounts of it inside cells. You can see enormous differences from cell to cell. Okay, but that's not a very good uh, piece of data, right? Because the stuff inside the cell, maybe some of it's not even working anymore. You really care about the morphogen that works, so you care about morphogen activity. So one way to do that is to measure the rate of, uh, of transcription of some morphogen target. And one way to measure that is to do what's called nuclear fluorescence in situ hybridization. So you make a probe to the intron of a gene, something that gets spliced out. So it's only there transiently while the gene's being transcribed. And it's in the nucleus. And while the gene's being transcribed, right, if you do in situ hybridization to that cell, the fixed at a certain point in time, probes will uh, to stick to that uh, intron uh, while it's on the gene being transcribed and produce a little fluorescent dot in the nucleus. And depending upon where you put the probe in the intron, whether it's early or late, essentially you're integrating the transcriptional rate over a period of time uh, that relates to how long it takes for the transcriptional machinery to move from here to here, in this case, 
or from here to here in that case. So you can have different averaging times. So you can do that with the DPP gradient because it has some nice targets, one of which is optomotor blind, which occurs uh, about two to three length scales away from the start of the DPP. Um, and it positions the L5 vein. And it has a nice big intron. And so you can put a probe. And you can actually see these dots. Each dot represents, in a sense, the rate of transcription averaged over about a 30-minute time period at each cell. And the cells are outlined in red, which is a stain for the edges of each nucleus. And so you can do that, and you do a lot of nice image processing to make sure you're actually measuring the total intensity of the dots. And if you measure the average dot intensity at a particular location in space, from the center to the edge, it looks just like what you'd get if you simply stained with an antibody to that target gene. It goes up and it comes down. OMB doesn't have that sharp a border. But if you look at the cell-to-cell -cell variability, this is what you see right, at those locations. And that gives you a coefficient of variation for the raw data that starts here and goes way above 1. Now, you have to correct for the fact that some of that variability is coming from measurement error. So you actually have to put two different colors on the same thing and look at the cross-correlation between them. And you correct for that, and you get a corrected measurement error. And you see that same thing, that as you get further out, the noise goes up which is what you expect, right? As the occupancy goes down, the stochastics become more and more dominant, and you get bigger noise as you go up. But basically, the noise is on the order here, where L5 would be formed, of about a coefficient of variation of 1. So if you take that and you multiply that by the decay length, to, the 2 is here because you have both sides um, of the, of, of the uh, intended original position. Uh, you get the expected uncertainty in vein L5 should be about 22 microns. And then you go and you measure vein L5 at the moment it's forming. It can be spotted by a particular transcription factor. And you measure the sort of steepness of its boundary, and it's about 7 microns. So we have about a factor of 3 different. Right? The noise should give you something that's fuzzy of about 22 microns. What we actually see is about 3 times better. OK. So. Is there a way that the system can improve the precision, right, given that we now see that there's a lot of noise and the noise is having an impact on the system? Well, one thing is since the imprecision depends upon the amplitude of the noise and the length scale, the decay length, you can just decrease the decay length, right? And then everything would be more precise. But why won't that work? Because if you decrease the decay length, everything will also be closer in, right? You just shrink everything. So that doesn't really work. Relative to the size of the field, you haven't, haven't improved anything at all. OK. Relative imprecision won't change. What else could you do? Well, you could try to improve the signal-to-noise ratio by increasing the, the amplitude, right? Remember, the coefficient of variation is reflecting the fact that you get more and more noise the lower and lower the mean. So let's kick up the mean, right? Let's just put in more and more and more morphogen, right? And then at farther and farther away, we'll have greater and greater receptor occupancy and less and less noise. What's the problem with that? Receptor saturation. <laughs> Remember, once you start saturating receptors, your robustness to parameters goes to hell, right? So you can fix the noise problem, but now you get another problem. And so you start putting this all together, and you see there's this constellation of interacting trade-offs such that you can, push the, you can push the gradient farther out by putting more morphogen in it, but then you shrink the region that's robust, the part of the gradient that's adequately robust, until it eventually disappears. And you get a hard limit somewhere, and again, these are very approximate numbers, but somewhere around 60 microns. You just can't do it anymore. Now, that's very interesting, because we've seen that number before, right? We heard Crick. And Watts, I mean, Crick and, uh, and Wolpert argue back in 69 and 70 about why morphogen gradients were short. And Crick appealed to a physics explanation. But I've just given you a completely different explanation, an engineering explanation that has to do with signal to noise versus robustness trade offs. OK, so a completely different way of answering the same question. OK, so I could go on for hours because. <laughs> You can come up with all kinds of good strategies to fix one problem 
that are destroyed by you know the, the the impact on another problem, and you know you can play those games. But at some point, eventually, you want to ask, well, what strategy is the wing actually choosing, All right? And that will give you some sense of what are the perturbations that development really cares about, and which are the ones you can deal with. Okay. So to do that, I want to go back to this issue of response to variation in receptors. Okay. And remember this curve that as receptors go up, morphogen gradients get taller but pull in. As they go down, morphogen gradients flatten and spread out, right? And I told you that even though receptors give acceptable performance only under a very small part of the, of the morphogen gradient, that the reality is that uh, you get really great patterning in receptor heterozygotes. And we know that this is essentially a 50% reduction in the level of receptors. What I didn't tell you is if you take those same heterozygotes and you look at them earlier in development while the wing disc is doing its patterning, that even though the pattern comes out normal in the adult, it is definitely not normal in the wing disc at the time patterning is happening. If you look at the phosphorylated MAD, which is the DPP signaling, it is indeed spread out in the case of the receptor heterozygote, and it's spread out by an amount that's just about what you'd predict from the model. So somehow, the receptors are, are non-robust. I mean, the system is non-robust when you look at the level of the DPP signal, and yet the pattern is retrieved anyway at the end of the day. Now, one way people, I'm sorry, go ahead. What is that? That's just a, we're, that's a ballpark that engineers like to use. We're just putting it there as an arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. But I mean, it, it's, it's just there as saying, if you use this number, those would be the conclusion. Sure, if you used a, a more generous number, you could sort of barely squeak by, right? But the, at the beginning, I showed you a lot of the robustness we observe is much better than that number. Okay, so that, I think that's already a pretty generous number for biology. Okay, so um, how is it, right, that this is pretty poor? It looks like an open loop model with no control, and yet you come up with the right pattern. So it's very typical in developmental biology when things like that happen to say, well, it gets fixed later, right? <laughs> Something happens in the pupil stage and gets the pattern back, and that's kind of a, a cop out, right? Because if it was fixed later, why did you even need to pattern it right in the first place, right? So I don't think that's a good explanation. But it turns out in this case, it's not the explanation. Because even well before those later stages, if you look during patterning at these transcription factor boundaries that mark where those veins are going to be, they are also robust. Okay? They're hardly changed at all in the presence of these heterozygous mutants. In fact, we can push it even farther. Rather than make a heterozygous, we can use RNAi to knock down the receptors to very low levels in this green domain here. So here's the DPP gradient. Here's the control part. Here's the part where we knock down receptors. And you see the PMAD is radically expanded in those cases. And in fact, the shape of how it's expanded really beautifully fits the very, very simple open loop model. And yet, the veins come out in exactly the right places. So we've totally trashed the gradient and the positional information that's specifying the pattern doesn't seem to have changed at all, right? And so this is true for all of the markers that we look at other than the phosphomad. With Brinker, which is the most direct target downstream of phosphomad, there's a very small effect, but by and large, all of these are robust, but the thing upstream of them is not robust, <laughs> right? So that's very peculiar, right? So how do we explain that? Some, again, something's wrong with the model, right? The mo it's, everything seems to fit the model until you get to here, and then it doesn't fit anymore when you get to the actual targets. So let's go back and think about that model again. Where does that exponential gradient model come from? It comes from this idea Right, morphogen produced, uniformly transported, taken up by receptors. And that's why you get these shapes, because receptors both play a role in how much signal, but they also play a role in the decay length of the gradient. 
So as you decrease receptors, the gradient spreads out, except very close to the source. Now, just for comparison, remember, uh, you know, Crick and Wolpert's linear model, the idea of just a source sink gradient. How does that behave if you were to vary the number of receptors in that? Well, that would be much simpler, right? More receptors, more binding. But the receptors are playing no role in the shape of the gradient. And so in that model, if you decrease the number of receptors, position would move to the left. Okay. So now you're beginning to think, wait a minute. What if we could build a model that was somewhere in between those two? Now you could have a model where, at least in some places, position wouldn't shift at all. Right? Now what's the reason for thinking that that might be feasible? Receptors are not uniformly expressed spatially. Receptors here, uh, stained, this is production of receptors with thick veins lap Z. You can see, here's the PMAG grading going out from the middle. These receptors are almost all concentrated at the edges. Here's a scan of the receptor profile. It's very, very low where DPP is produced, then it stays low and then starts climbing towards the edges and climbs about fivefold. It's a little hard to um, estimate exactly. And the reason for this is because the patterning genes are themselves feeding back on receptor expression. So there's a big negative feedback loop here on receptor expression. Now, what's the consequence of that? So again, remember we have our simple model. We can take an asymptotic approximation of having all the receptors over at one end as being like having a constant low level of receptors and then at the very end have a sink. Okay? Because that we can actually solve analytically. That's the same as solving this equation with an added sink at a certain position. And then it has a fairly simple form. And if you plot it, when the sink is relatively nearby compared to this decay length constant, it makes a line. And when the sink is really far away, it makes an exponential. Okay? Does that make sense? Right? If the sink is very close, the receptors that are present within the gradient really don't matter. It may as well be free diffusion. If the sink is far away, everything's already taken up before you get to the sink. Right? So essentially, by varying the amount and position of receptors at a distance, you can essentially get a gradient to lie somewhere between the linear and the exponential. Okay. And in fact, if you do that, if you model this amount of receptors into that sort of gradient, you get a shape that looks something like this green curve here. And look what happens when you change the level of receptors down or up by a factor of two. It's not very robust over here, but of course here's not where DPP patterns. Here's where DPP patterns, and it's very robust. Okay, so you can get this robustness um, simply by uh, being somewhere between exponential and linear. And here, this is just to show, in terms of sensitivity curves, the top shows what the linear would do, the bottom shows what an exponential would do, and the blue shows you that there's, when these gradients are, at least are not too large compared to their own intrinsic decay lengths, there's this region of very, very low sensitivity for the mixed curve. Okay, so that gives you a way to explain how you can shape a gradient so that its sensitivity to receptors can be really low, at least when the gradient is of an appropriate size. But it still hasn't solved the problem of how it is that the robustness to, uh, to phosphorylated MAD, the thing at the top of the, of the um, pathway here, is so much worse than the robustness to the things downstream of it. That, that needs another explanation, although it's related. And for that, we have to remember something that Frank referred to last week, which is that disks are not static. They're actually growing during patterning. And as they grow, the morphogen gradient is expanding with them. We'll talk a minute about how it's expanding with it. But remember that as morphogen gradients expand, and have all the receptors at one end, right? they are going to gradually shift from being linear to exponential. 
Okay, they're going to go through that transition over time. And in fact, if you look closely, that's exactly what you see. You can even see it in other people's data, which is remarkable, because in the very same papers where they tell you that the gradients are exponential, and then they overlie them all on top of each other, you can see they're almost a straight line <laughs> rather than exponential. Early gradients tend to be quite straight, and then as time goes on, they tend to bend more and more and eventually be more and more exponential. So you would predict that the phosphorylated MAD gradient would show, and that all these gradients would show, different robustness properties depending upon the time at which you look. Do you look early, when it's more linear, late, when it's more exponential, or somewhere in the middle? Okay. So timing matters not only because the gradient is changing, but because all of these factors, all these molecules, have their own time constants. Yes, for us. Not in this particular, um, not in this particular um, graph, but but I can. Yes, if I did that, then this would be more like that. Well, so these are getting these ones that are quite late are getting to a point when the disks are. Actually, no, actually, I think those are rescaled. But those disks are stopping growth towards the end. So things are getting exponential right about the time that the disks are slowing down as well. But I think the, the, this is a funny axis. You can see it's kind of messy here. These are pooled based on which size categories, and then they're scaled for the size category. Um, and I think these are all then overlaid so they start with more or less the same de decline. So I can show you other pictures, but this is just the one I happen to pick out. Um, okay, so the point here is that the timing at which you'll achieve different robustness properties depends a lot on the kind of intrinsic relaxation times associated with the different uh, species in here. And those are determined by the half-lives of those molecules. So, for example, phosphorylated MAD has a very, very short half-life. If I throw in a drug that blocks the signaling by the receptor, phosphorylated MAD is gone within 25 minutes. On the other hand, optimotor blind, one of those transcription factors that sets the L5 vein, um, if I induce RNAi in half the disk and watch the protein disappear over time, I can calculate that the half-life is about five to six hours. Okay, many times longer. And um, furthermore, to get from phosphomed to OMB, you have to go through Brinker, and again, using a drug to block DPP signaling and seeing how the um, uh, expression of OMB turns off, we can estimate that there's at least two to three more hours in the Brinker delay. So you can put all this together into equations for DPP, receptor, phosphor phosphorylated MAD, Brinker, you can put in there, OMB. The point is you can follow the actual time evolution of the different gradients. And what you see is for things that turn over quickly, they are robust early. That is, they've reached that stage of being partially exponential, partially linear at about this point in time. And then they lose that as they become truly exponential. Whereas things like OMB will start off being more linear here and will reach that stage of being partially linear, partially exponential over here. And so this will be robust, and this will be non-robust. So it's not actually that the phosphorylated MAD didn't control the OMB. It's that, in a sense, you're looking at different eras of time when you look at different signals. When you look at phosphorylated MAD, you're looking at present time. And when you look at OMB, you're looking at the shape of the gradient 12 hours earlier. And if this is correct, what we should predict is if you look earlier, that non-robustness of phosphomad should go away. And in fact, it does. If you look earlier, you can see that even phosphomad is, is robust. So um, having a very long half-life for this transcription factor actually explains another puzzle. Because remember, we used OMB as a measurement of the intrinsic noise in the gradient. And we said, oh, it has this very, very high level of noise. Right? And the transition width of 
abrupt was 7 microns, not 22 microns. But I was just looking at the noise in the transcription of OMB. Now that you know that OMB has a long half-life, right, it can, by the, you know, what we were discussing before, it can essentially average out a certain amount of that noise at the protein level, even if the noise is there at the transcriptional level. And indeed, it can reduce the noise by as much as the square root of the ratio between the protein and RNA half-lives versus the transcriptional averaging time. Remember, we transcriptionally averaged over about 30 minutes. The protein's about six hours. So you could get a three-and-a-half-fold improvement in the noise just by time averaging. And so, in fact, if you go in and you stain for OMB, and you look at the protein noise as opposed to the transcript noise, it is about threefold lower, and that is sufficient to explain why the imprecision is about seven microns. So, in, in a sense, that all finally agrees once you recognize that the protein is so stable. But the protein being so stable then is the thing that separates the time regimes over which it and the signal are robust. Okay, I have almost no time and I, I will very quickly talk uh, about the last uh, control objective, which is adaptability, because this was something that Frank introduced last week, and I just sort of want to uh, quickly uh, pick up on this topic, which is scaling. So as he mentioned, a lot of patterns will scale for different sizes. It's a very natural thing through evolution, through developmental perturbations. The DPP gradient is a typical example of that. One of the best examples of scaling I know of are these old experiments where Steve Cohen used a, a trick to cause one half of the disk, the posterior half, to either grow extra big or to be extra small compared to wild type. And then he measured what happened to the DPP pattern when you made the domain extra big or extra small, and the pattern got extra big and extra small. So as you stretch the disk, the pattern stretches with it. Okay, and he did this in the posterior half of the disk, and he used the anterior half as a control. And it's also been pointed out by several groups that during normal growth, uh, not just in this perturbation scenario, the disk is growing and the DPP gradient is expanding with it. Actually, you can see how linear it is at early stages. Um, but nevertheless, you can still force this to fit an exponential, and you can get that the approximate exp uh, decay length is going up linearly with time. Okay, so as Frank mentioned, uh, Barkai produced a model a few years ago called the expander repressor model to explain how this scaling can occur. And in this model, right, you have the standard morphogen uptake model with its standard decay length. The only way to scale the thing is to change the decay length, right? And so the idea is that the morphogen signal represses an expander which then diffuses back throughout the entire gradient and either changes the diffusion or changes the uptake, right? You've got to change either D or K in order to change that decay length. It's actually very hard to change D, so we now know it's really K. Um, and then I also mentioned yesterday that in that model, the decay of the expander is considered negligible, giving this integral feedback properties. You don't really need this to have it be a feedback control but to have set point control where you have perfect expansion, uh, then you need to have this as well. Okay. And then Frank mentioned there's a candidate expander, a molecule called Pentagon or Magu, which uh, is expressed at the very edges of the disk, right where DPP, the DPP gradient ends is where this thing is on. Its expression is repressed by DPP. If you lose it, you shrink the gradient. You can see a tremendous shrinkage of the gradient. If you overexpress it, you expand the gradient. And if you're mutant for it, your gradients don't scale. So this is scaling shown that's on a logarithmic axis, which is why these don't look like curves. But you can see that when you uh, uh, normalize your gradients to the size of the disk, they all line up. They're scaling. In a Pentagon mutant, there isn't scaling. Notice, by the way, that this, the absolute numbers are very different here because the Pentagon mutants are so short. So it's a wonderful, wonderful model, beautiful math, unfortunately slain by several ugly facts. Okay? The first fact, which was already known at the time, is that the expander repressor model, which assumes that the expander goes everywhere, would predict that expander on one side and the other side mix with each other, right? Because it has to go everywhere. If that were the case, 
it would not have been possible for Cohen to observe that when you um, expand or shrink one half of the gradient, you have no effect on the other half of the gradient. The two halves, anterior and posterior, are completely insulated from each other. But there is no diffusion barrier between them. In fact, if you overexpress pentagon in the posterior, it does its job in the anterior. So it can diffuse across between the compartments. There's no problem there. Nevertheless, you can independently scale the two compartments. And that's, that's not consistent with the Barkheim model. The second thing is, if you just knock out pentagon on one side, you only affect the length scale, the decay length, on that side, that half of the gradient. You don't affect the decay length on that half. Again, the two sides are completely independent here. So here we're taking out pentagon everywhere. Right? Here we're taking out pentagon just in the posterior, and we only affect the decay length in the posterior. The third thing is if you make a GFP fusion to pentagon, which is completely functional and rescues wild type and so on, you can actually measure how far it travels in a, in a disk, and it travels even less far than DPP. It has a decay length of less than 10 microns. So it clearly, A, is destroyed, so forget about integral feedback. Um, but B, it also doesn't travel very far. Right, has a very short decay length. Um, and finally, recent work shows that the way Pentagon works is by causing the destruction of this thing called DALI and DALI-like, which are co-receptors for DPP. So you can see when you express Pentagon here, you get rid of DALI and DALI-like over there. But if you make little clones where you overexpress Pentagon, you only get rid of DALI and DALI-like in and just barely around those clones, and hardly at any distance at all. So pentagon is not a long-range acting factor. Okay, so it doesn't have the characteristics of the long-range expander repressor model, which then begs the question of how in the world does pentagon enable scaling? Because it's expressed way over there, and you're scaling the gradient way over here. Right? And we, it is a diffusible molecule. So if we go back to the expander repressor molecule model, the reason why it has to be transported uniformly throughout the gradient is because the morphogen in this model is taken up uniformly throughout the gradient. That is, the decay length is set by this uniform K, this uniform uptake. But we already know that's not true, right? We already know that the receptors are concentrated over at the far end. And what else is at the far end? Pentagon, right? So can we rescue this model to a model in which DPP in the periphery represses Pentagon in the periphery which acts on receptor function in the periphery, but receptor function in the periphery affects the decay length everywhere and consequently gives you, closes the loop on scaling. And so if you model that, that actually works pretty well. If the gradient is not too far away, is not too close yet to being exponential, as long as the gradient is in that middle zone between being a little bit linear and a little bit exponential, then simply affecting the strength of the receptors. So pink is measuring uh, where pentagon would be expressed. And it's simply acting by inhibiting receptor function. And you can see that as the tissue grows out, the gradient scales. And the dotted line represents the best fit exponential. So through most of this, an experimentalist would never be able to tell that that wasn't an exponential. Um, if you do the same thing again, but you don't have pentagon having that effect on the receptors. You see the thing just goes out and becomes an exponential early on and just stops. Okay, so indeed, you can um, use pentagon to keep the gradient in that quasi-linear state for longer, but eventually you lose it, and eventually you can't scale anymore, and that's actually what's observed. The scaling does not go on forever, but it ends somewhere about half a day before the end of the last larval instar, things stop scaling, and then also things stop growing, which gives you a nice way to sort of time the size of the disk. You had a question? Is the intuition for how it works similar Yeah, essentially it is, which is a, a, a kind of cruel irony, because if you go back to Wolpert's original 1969 paper, the whole reason for the source sync model was the fact that it perfectly scales. And that was something that no one had noticed before in the morphogen because the idea of morph diffusible morphogens had been around before Wolpert. But he pointed out if you use a source sync model, not only do you have positional information, but it scales perfectly. 
And as soon as gradients were appreciated not to be linear, everybody forgot that aspect. <laughs> And now, it, in a sense, it's kind of come back because this resuscitates the sort of value of that, but only temporarily. So it only allows you to go so far, right? Once you hit that magic one to one and a half length scales, intrinsic length scales, the system goes back to being exponential, can't scale anymore. And interestingly, if you were to couple that with growth, then the disk would always stop at a fixed scale and size. Last thing is, is there any way to test this idea experimentally? Um, and there is one thing we can do, which we could take away that non-uniform expression of the receptor. So it turns out someone had already made a fly stock in which thick veins, the receptor, is uniformly expressed everywhere. And you can then put that over a, a null mutant for thick veins, so there's no more endogenous receptor. And those flies are pretty good. They make some little errors in the actual formations of the veins, but the patterning of the veins is perfectly normal. Um, and the flies grow a little bit slow, but, but other than that, the disks are, are pretty normal. But if you look at their ability to scale under normal growth, uh, you can see it's terribly disrupted. Right? All we've done here is flattened the receptor profile, and now a lot of the scaling goes away. Okay, so I've gone a little bit over, so let me just end by, by giving you a few take-home messages. The first is it's very easy to make a morphogen gradient. It's very easy to fit the profiles of morphogen gradients with very, very simple models. But making a morphogen gradient that's robust and noise tolerant and forms quickly and adjusts, that's the hard stuff, right? And what makes it hard is not just the doing any one of those things, but doing all of those things together because of all the interference of one objective with another. We currently know some of these loops here, but I'm sure there's a lot of information we're still missing because the kinds of experiments or genetic screens, as Eric talked about yesterday, that would reveal components doing this kind of things, those are difficult screens to design. How would you find it unless you knew the perturbation that it was, it was there to cancel? So I think there's a lot we're still missing here, but at least this gives us some source material for thinking about how the feed feedback and feed forward circuitry might be giving you control. It still doesn't tell us that's what the disk is really doing with that machinery. That requires a lot more experimental work. Um, but, you know, in the end, I think, uh, I think it's a lot better than just assuming we know everything. Um, I also just wanted to put up some of the names of people in my group who've been involved in producing some of the data I told you about, and I didn't have time to, uh, uh, to properly credit them. So, okay, thanks, and I'll be happy to take your questions.